Good evening, everybody. And on behalf of OL, I want to thank you for all, your, for all of you for logging in from all around the world. We appreciate the opportunity to collaborate once again with Neshamos to provide an important service to the larger community. My name is David Leaptag, and I direct OHEL's Department of School Support Services. We have a range of services that support yeshivas and day schools in the area of mental health, ranging from professional development workshops and training for teachers to therapeutic intervention and counseling for children from preschool through high school. I have put my contact information in the chat. Please feel free to contact me if we can help in any way. Before we begin, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the educators, the Morot, the Rabbeim, the teachers, the administrators, the support staff, for all your heroic efforts during the last few months and for all you are doing for our children now and in the future. As a former Yeshiva Day School principal, I am keenly aware of the tremendous work that you do to educate all our children and stand in awe of your recent accomplishments during COVID-19. Our focus this evening is on helping children the title for tonight's presentation is Recognizing Signs of Trauma in Students, Helping Them Adapt and Build Resilience. Our presenters are Dr. Norman Blumenthal, Racheli Gross, and Sivi Ryder. Dr. Norman Blumenthal is a clinical psychologist. He is the Zachter Family Chair in Trauma and Crisis Counseling at OHEL and Director of the OHEL Miriam Center for Trauma, Bereavement, and Civil Response, Crisis Response. He will uh, speak first and discuss the effects of trauma on children and some of the signs that educators should be aware of in identifying children who may need uh, intervention. Our second presenter is Racheli Gross, known affectionately as Corona Mora on Instagram. She is a highly experienced educator who presently serves as a public school principal in the Malvern School District in Long Island, New York. Racheli will discuss from an educational perspective a number of concrete ideas that schools can do to help children navigate through this current crisis. Our third presenter is Sivi Ryder, who serves as OHEL's Director of Children's Services. She is an expert in the area of trauma response and resilience building. She will share with you how you can create a trauma-sensitive school that develops resilience in children. She will also share with you a number of resources that OHEL is offering to the community that are designed to meet students' needs both during and after COVID-19. Each of our distinguished speakers will have approximately 15 minutes. I will monitor questions in the chat. We hope to have some time for a few questions at the end. And so on behalf of all our presenters and the entire team at OHEL, I wish everyone a ksiva v'chasima tova. Okay. And Dr. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. And again, uh, repeating what I've often said, I want to, it's a privilege and honor uh, to work with uh, Rabbi Nu and the Shamos and to share the podium with uh, Rachel Gross, who always comes with such great practical suggestions, and with Sivi Ryder, who is really somebody I've worked very close and partnered with and has been, I'm sure, mutually enriching. And of course, we've got to thank uh, Ravi Liptag uh, for his directorship and guidance during, uh, for this seminar I and all the, a lot of the school projects that I was involved in. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to be uh, focusing on trauma, what trauma is, what anxiety is, and grief primarily, and how it, how it manifests itself when uh, uh, children return to school. So first, let's start with what is trauma? So we're going to start with a definition. Traumatic experience shake the foundations of our beliefs about safety and shatter our assumptions about trust. In other words, a traumatic event, we go through life expecting uh, tomorrow to be like yesterday, and uh, you know, they have to be like tomorrow, and, and for the most part, it is. And this causes us a certain equanimity. Uh, certain calmness because life is predictable. We'll go to work, we'll come home, our family will be there, etc. But on those rare occasions, and of course, God forbid, when that routine is disrupted or uprooted, then we have a traumatic experience, a traumatic response because life is not as we had expected. And I think the way that translates into the topic we're talking about today uh, in terms of the coronavirus is that we were just waltzing through life this year, uh, January, February, and then suddenly in March, I knew oh, going through life expecting, you know, having Passover and, uh, and the graduation and summer vacation, et cetera, and then suddenly the rug got pulled out from under us, and this is a traumatic event. Plus the fact that the research shows pretty convincingly that quarantine alone is a traumatic event and a traumatic event that has a lot of the characteristics of trauma. <clears throat> so because they are so far out of what we would expect, these events provoke reactions that feel strange and quote unquote crazy. 
even though these reactions are unusual, disturbing, they're atypical and expectable. So the odd thing about trauma is very often the person who's traumatized thinks they're uh, losing their mind. But what's, off, what's really the case is that they're actually having a reaction to a situation that really would be normal and expected. So sometimes the way I put it to people is what's pathological. It's not that you, there's something sick going on inside of you. There's something sick going on in the world. Or there's something sick going on in your life. So it's very much like, and it's a quote that just sort of captures it. Uh, and anytime you talk about trauma, and it's a both, uh, the quote from Viktor Frankl, a very famous psychiatrist and author who survived in uh, Auschwitz, he said an abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is normal. So trauma reactions are normal, even just the heightened vigilance and alertness is because trauma, uh, the, the events represent the threat. And if, and if we're threatened, then we become more vigilant and alert. Okay, so what are the characteristics of trauma? So what's interesting is that what trauma typically does is it brings you back to the traumatic event. That's sometimes very confusing to people because let's say, let's say somebody has been through whatever, uh, a, a car accident, uh, an armed robbery, uh, a fire or something like that. And let's say they survive and they're okay. They would really like to put it out of their mind. They really would like to forget about it. And by the way, there is such a response. There is such a thing as a post-traumatic amnesia, but very, not so common. But what's interesting is in many of the cases, the brain actually brings the person back to the trauma. And this is also often very disconcerting to the person. So these can include flashbacks. That's the most common one. I'm sure we've all had them. We're just, you relax and suddenly an image, like a photograph from, from events that had happened will suddenly intrude on your mind. And as I said, it's very disconcerting, but it's like the brain bringing you back, trigger responses. I mean, I, you know, I remember once walking with a cousin of mine who was visiting from Israel shortly after the Yom Kippur War, and there was a, a loud sort of noise and he was in combat position. Right away, you go back to that trauma, nightmares, unrealistic fears of recurrence. Now, it's a little more beyond the, the scope of what we're talking about today, why that happens. There is a psychological reason for that, but that's very typical of a, of a traumatic response that, again, the, the, the car, let's say uh, the, the car accident happened already, and for weeks, sometimes even months later, every once in a while, images from that scary event pop into your brain. Now, we, we, they ban, people banty about the PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Believe it or not, the PTSD is very rare. Um, PTSD stands for post-traumatic stress and the D is disorder. That means a reaction to a trauma where you're literally, your functioning is compromised. More common among people who've had recurrent trauma, soldiers returning from, from war or something along those lines. More common for us in the traumatic events that we face and probably uh, for the coronavirus that we're in the middle of right now is a post-traumatic reaction or response. That we have some of these symptoms, but not to such a severe level that we can't function. Maybe we're functioning on four cylinders, but we're functioning. Now, what's unique and interesting about the trauma that we're going through with the pandemic is a lot of the examples I gave are about situations where the trauma had a beginning, middle, and end. It occurred, and now you're, you're being brought back. And again, just very quickly, the reason why the brain does is you have to integrate the experience into your life and into your understanding of life. But we're in a situation where it's still sort of going on. Oh, it may not. I hope, I'm, I hope it isn't. But well, it seems pretty apparent that the virus is not gone. So therefore, it, there was a trauma, the trauma of quarantine, the trauma of the very sudden ending of school, but we're not done with it yet. So there's a very big difference between removing the trauma that is no longer extant from empowering the individual in the event of recurrence. So the approach is very different. When we're talking about a trauma that had occurred, we don't expect it to recur. We try to sort of cleanse the person of those flashbacks. We try to help the person integrate the experience so that he, the person can go on without being haunted by those events. Right now, it's, we don't know if it's over or not. And therefore, the, the approach is very much to empower the individual and say there are things we can do to keep ourselves safe. So we safe. We can have uh, social distancing. We can wear masks. We can we can practice proper hygiene, and in as I said, empower the individual and make the individual feel secure 
and their capacity to remain safe and prevent the recurrence. This will, by the way, be very much focused upon by Tzvi Ryder as she talks about resilience. Now, an important point in terms of, of trauma, and this is very interesting and important to understand, is that our natural, what we'd naturally assume is if somebody went through a traumatic event, immediately afterwards, there would be the post-trauma symptoms. But sometimes there is a lapse. Sometimes there's a dormant period. Now, very often, the dormant period is because after the trauma, the person has some life rebuilding to do. I think we see this most dramatically in the event of a residential fire. Uh, again, if you, don't know any, if you know anybody who ever survived a residential fire or know of people, you know, you lose everything. You, you, you know, you lose your wardrobe, your, 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 your papers, your, your passport, your, you know, your pictures. You have nothing. And you right away have to find some place to live. And you have to deal with insurance adjusters. You have to rebuild your house. And uh, there's a lot that has to be done pragmatically so that while that is going on, the person doesn't really relive the trauma. And when everything's in place, the person's in their new home and, they're light, and they have papers and they're replenished to replace the, the pictures and et cetera, that's sometimes when they start getting the nightmares. Because now they, it's almost as if the brain very adaptively parks, you know, sort of files away the trauma, and then when you have you can you can deal with it, it comes back. And I'm you know again my my ruach hakodesh is somewhat limited, and I think uh, last time I quoted uh, you know, the great philosopher Yogi Berra used to say predicting is very difficult, especially about the future. But the truth is, I think, and I think we're starting to see that from already some schools reporting kids starting to return that we're going to probably have a honeymoon phase that when the kids first come back, first of all, newness grabs their attention. And there's a lot they gotta get used to. They have to get used to going back in school after, after being away for six months. They have to get used to all these new arrangements, uh, the, the masks and social distancing and the, and the different kind of recess and lunch period, et cetera. So their focus is very much on the setting. And there's even a little acceleration about being reunited with friends and back into their school. So I would anticipate that until probably the holidays, things are going to be pretty smooth. And most of the teachers are going to say, hey, you know, it's really not so bad. Things are okay. Just wait till October when there's no big vacation coming up anymore. And it's starting to get dark and it's getting cold. And now they're not, it, the newness of the school doesn't fo require their focus. That will be probably when some of the post-trauma symptoms might emerge from those who had, were traumatized by the quarantine or possibly as well by, by family members being sick or even family members who had died. Okay, now let's uh, introduce you to anxiety, okay? Because that was the other issue that I was supposed to talk about. Okay, so again, definition is from the American Psychological Association. Anxiety is an emotion characterized by feeling of tension, worried thoughts, physical changes like increased blood pressure. It's basically fear, but it's a, a, not a, a, a very clear fear of something very specific. So in other words, if you're walking down the street and a lion is running towards you, you may have an anxiety or you may have fear. It's very adaptive. But uh, anxiety is a more of an emotional fear where the actual persistent isn't clear. People with anxiety disorders usually have recurring intrusive thoughts or concerns. They may avoid certain situations out of worry. They may also have physical symptoms such as sweating, trembling, dizziness, or rapid heartbeat. And that's the interesting thing about anxiety. Anxiety has a lot of physical correlates. So the, the kid who's constantly going to the nurse with stomach aches, headaches, et cetera, very often that is anxiety. And what we're talking about now is the anxiety about returning to school uh, still while the pandemic is going on. Now, here's a very important point and not terribly well understood, which is most of the time when we talk about something that we would characterize as a disorder, so we want to get rid of it. You know, so we want to get rid of the coronavirus. We, we, we needed like a hole in the head. We, we would get strep throat, you want to get rid of it. Anxiety, we don't want to get rid of. We want to have it at manageable le levels because the right amount of anxiety is sort of essential in order for survival and for motivation. So for example, and I just jump to the bottom, research on uh, levels of stress and anxiety during a mathematics exam 
shows that the ones who do best on the exam are the ones who have a middle level of anxiety. Those who have too little or too much don't do as well. Why? The ones who have too much are overwrought, intense, and, and they can't perform well. The ones who have too little just don't care. So you need anxiety proportionate to the situation. And that's exactly the case, uh, or, for that, you know, that's exactly, or for that matter, even for safety. In other words, again, as an example I give, if any of you who are parents, the first time one of your toddlers wandered into the street or tried to wander into the street, you scared the living daylights out of them. That was great because that ensured their safety. It made them scared to go back into the street. Or when we do stranger, uh, you, know, in, you know, what's it called? Avoiding strangers or, or uh, intruder drills. We scare the children because there needs to be a certain amount of fright, which helps them take precautionary measures. The same thing is true with the pandemic. We have, we, and this applies to ourselves, as teaching it applies to the children. We have to have the right level of anxiety. And the children have to have the right level of anxiety. So we could have children who are, again, too anxious and are therefore, where the anxiety is disproportionate with the threat in the air, we have to engage them in such a way to build up their resilience and to build up their, their equanimity, which you'll hear about from the next presenters. But you can have too little as well. You can have that, the, 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 the stereotypical daredevil who doesn't like to be made afraid. And he's, he thinks this, this mask stuff is stupid and he's just going to take it off and he's going to be close to people because he's not worried, he's not afraid. That's somebody you have to make more anxious. So you have to reach that, uh, that optimal level of anxiety. And then the last topic that I'm going to cover before I hand it over uh, to, to Racheli Gross is the issue of post-COVID grief, which has been a very big focus, both in terms of loss of, of there have been some children who have lost parents, and more commonly, children who have lost grandparents. And what has this been like? So first of all, it's a rapid and sudden deterioration. We, we ran many groups for either both adults and children who lost parents. And one of the themes that comes up again and again is he walked into that solar ambulance without anyone by his or her side. It looked like, all right, he needs a little trip to the hospital to get a little shot here and there and he's going to be home. And then, or she's going to be home. And then in three weeks later, they're going to notice that he died and they weren't even by his side. So this, this is what's, what part of what's so destabilizing by, by the losses that took place. Also, there was a loss of family members of school personnel without rituals, burials, commemoration. Um, these things are important. This helps with the grieving process and not having, you know, having a Zoom uh, eulogies or, or Shiva just doesn't quite cut it. One of the interesting things we found is that many people who had been sitting shiva during this COVID crisis, one of the things they found very hard was that when the shiva was over, usually the last day, some have the custom of walking around the block, but ultimately you resume your normal life. And that's painful, but necessary. Here, the shiva was over and they were still sitting at home. Maybe they could take a shower and change their clothing, but they didn't have that transition to the real world. So when you don't have the opportunity for these kind of very healthy commemorations or, or, or acknowledgments of death, then the, the, the grief tends to linger. It becomes much harder to, to achieve uh, the, the consolation. And, which was a very common theme among the children, or mostly teens that we, we, talk, we talked to who had, lost a, who had lost a parent, is excessive worry about the surviving parent. That would be even in time, in healthy, in normal times. But can imagine knowing the pandemic is around and knowing you have only one parent, your eggs are all in one basket, uh, makes, it creates a great deal of anxiety. And many children I know have even resisted going back to school because they don't want to be the one bringing home the illness that could potentially compromise or, or, or cause the death of the now surviving parent and make them really full orphans. So this is an extremely important issue. And many schools are allowing these children to stay home and not have or to learn remotely. And by the way, also you should know if you have a child in your school who had experienced a death, that there's a lot of ambivalence about sharing it when they come back to school because children this age, they don't want to be pitied and they don't want to spotlight on them. So on the one hand, they're in pain. On the one hand, especially for the younger children, the teacher often is a parental-like figure, someone they'd want to pour their heart out to. On the other hand, they don't want to be the, oh, you poor thing, you lost your parent. So they're, they're, you'll get a lot of this kind of ambivalent responses when they return to the school. And last but not least, which is going to probably be more common, is grandparent grief. 
something that we don't give perhaps enough attention to. And you have to understand also that the grandparent, the status of grandparents today is very different, certainly than when I was a child. I, I grew up in a neighborhood where we were, were all children of refugees or Holocaust survivors. I often say that I had one friend who had American born parents who once asked them, how come they don't speak English? Uh, it, how come they don't speak English like his friends? Because they're the only ones who didn't have an accent. Um, so, and I actually had a grandparent who was ancient. I mean, he was, you know, when I was a kid, he was in his eighties. And he was like a novelty. Friends of mine would come over and look at him like they were going to a museum. Today, it's very common to have grandparents, great grandparents, and, and grandparents are very young and robust and healthy and active and et cetera. So it is a different kind of loss. Also, um, the grandparent represents very important parts of their lives. It represent, the grandparent represents the unadulterated love just spoiling the kid, which is good for them to have. Parent can't do that. Also, and, as I, and I know some of you may talk about this, there's a lot of research on ancestral narrative and coping. Knowing the grandparent is the connection with previous generations. And knowing where you come from and the connection and those, those stories and those forms of coping are very important for a child's coping. And now that person may not be here. However, I will tell you that my, uh, my anticipation is, we'll see if I'm correct, that the children will have an easier time discussing the death of a grandparent in school than they will about the parent. Because it's not gonna evoke that pity. They're not orphans. And the grandparent is older, so it's a little more natural that they would die. And I think they would be more willing to write compositions, to talk about the grandparent and their background than they would were had they lost a parent. So it might be something that may be more accessible uh, in the school. Okay, I hope that was helpful. Uh, and I now I uh, very gladly hand the podium over to Corona Mara, who will, who will, again, will give us more pragmatic and, and useful, uh, useful suggestions for the classroom. Thank you, Dr. Blumenthal. Uh, once again, I wanna thank OHEL um, for inviting me. I, they keep inviting me back, so I think we're doing something right by uh, the combinations of speakers that we have in place. And Dr. Blumenthal usually sets up the, um, you know, the, the psychology of it all. And what I try to offer are some practical examples um, of how we can, especially tonight, talk about support our kids when they come back to school. Now, you know, as a, a teacher by trade, I like to organize things. So before I approach a problem, I usually like to kind of create a framework for myself. So the framework that I've been working with, um, probably since, you know, we started talking about reopening plans are, is the trifecta of, of what a child needs and what would be kind of the guiding principles to how we would reopen and how we would reopen safely and effectively. And that is, Every question, every event that we put in place, every, you know, facet to the reopening plan that we um, talked about or discussed or explored had to fit the criteria of social emotional learning and how does this support the, you know, emotional well-being of the child, health and safety, does whatever we want to put in place or consider make sure that the students are safe and continuity of learning. Obviously, it's a school, and the primary focus of school is academics and instruction, and does this piece that we want to include in our reopening plan support continuity of learning? So that's the framework that I want to kind of talk about today. So if we talk about social emotional learning, you know, I think teachers right now are feeling very overwhelmed and asking the question of, isn't that the job of the guidance counselor? I'm not a social worker. I'm not trained in social emotional learning. I don't have a psychology degree. I know how to teach reading and writing. So I think we have to kind of adopt the mindset is that you can approach social emotional learning through academics. And it really is that you just need to provide um, a safe space for learning and you can, children can find success in your classroom. It's just a matter of how you frame things. So um, in terms of giving students opportunities to share in journal writing where they can talk about their life, um, think about the workload especially at the start of the school year and how you're assigning homework and that, how that could affect their home life and then how they feel when they come back to school. Um, you know, there's a lot of work that uh, educators have done on the responsive classroom in terms of giving student choice on how they share their feelings. Everything from a daily check-in feeling chart to choosing a way that they want to greet their peers. Obviously now with social distancing, instead of hugs and high fives, it's waves and silly dances but it still gives the child the opportunity to take ownership of their feelings and it's okay to have good days and it's okay to have not great days. Um, you know, 
if your school didn't start yet, consider thinking about sending postcards, sending out a video, doing something to the child. We've been addressing all of these back to school memos and reopening plans to the adults. It's time to address the child because the child is the one that's returning. So think about you know, the third grader who is anxious about returning to school and suddenly gets a postcard in the mail, either from the teacher or from the school, knowing that, wow, they're waiting for me. It's not just my parent that they're informing. Also, um, there's been a lot of cancellations, a lot of cancellations of fun stuff. And school is a social experience. And I know that, you know, we're not going to have recess the same way. We're not going to have school assemblies and we're not going to have gatherings and get togethers. But there are some creative ways that you can still have that social experience. If your school is um, equipped with technology, you know, it's, you know, a very popular thing to have um, Skype or Zoom pen pals in other countries. Consider the room next door. You know, maybe Mrs. So-and-so can be Zoom pen pals with the room next door just so that they can interact and see each other. And that can be through technology or good old fashioned letter writing. You can have set up mailboxes outside the classroom doors and the kids can actually pair it up with a, paired up with a peer in their own school and probably discover new things about their own peers um, and form relationships that way, even though they can't be together in the cafeteria or the lunchroom or where they typically would have been mingling. Um, you know, Principles that are on today, consider don't cancel things. Find ways to maintain the spirit of whatever programming you typically do. So if you normally have a monthly assembly, figure out a way to get a message into the classrooms. So is it a pre-recorded video so that every classroom can feel that they're part of something? Because obviously sense of community is what schools provide so beautifully. And now there's going to feel like a disconnect. Is do you have the capacity to do Zoom in the classroom and you know project on the smart boards so that we can have that feeling of an assembly? Things like that. Um, women's leagues and PTAs, talk to them about what kind of programming they can do. I know my Parent Teacher Association is planning a school-wide paint night at the end of September in lieu of our back to school barbecue. So find ways to not cancel, but say, wow, we can do this instead. Then I shift over into the health and safety portion. Um, consider sending out photos of whatever your temperature procedures are gonna be, videos of whatever the health screening protocols are gonna be. Uh, I sat today with a couple of teachers and we wrote a script and we actually took a video of what it's going to look like when you enter the building. Everything from the signage that you have posted to what the machine that they're gonna have to walk through or get scanned by looks like because once the kids feel like they know what they're expecting, anxiety will automatically be reduced. Um, and in the classroom, it's so important to share the protocols, but also discuss the why. I know I spoke about it uh, the other night with administrators and teachers um, about themselves and how they can self-care by explaining the why, because then kids will be compliant. But in reality, it's for the children. They need to understand why they're doing what they're doing. Um, and then we want to think also about, you know, is it designing their own masks? Is when you do that getting to know you activity in the beginning of the year where they usually draw a self-portrait, consider maybe this year they can design their own mask to go along with it just to promote whatever procedures the school has in place. Um, and then also consider having the students create the signage. If they're the ones recognizing the situation, then you have a discussion about why you need to do certain things. If the students themselves are drawing the signs that get put around the school, they're going to take pride when they walk in the halls, take ownership of the artwork. And now again, you've created that sense of community, which we're going to feel has gone away a little bit. And then continuity of learning. We talk about the classroom because the classroom is going to look very different. Usually you pull a reading group together and the kids get to, you know, conference with one another. So you really have to think about the children feeling successful and, teachers out there who are listening tonight, I really hope that we can um, make sure that we don't use negative language and we switch to the positive language. And what do I mean? Instead of focusing on all the time that we miss, the skills that we have to fill, it's very easy for a teacher to say, we missed so much last year, we have a lot to do. Let's, we know that happened, but let's kind of switch it to be positive because you want the kids to feel successful and not all of the stuff that they missed. Um, and I would suggest that when you're spending time on review in the beginning of the year, focus less about the skill gap that you're trying to fill, but more on making sure that the kids feel successful. So if you know your class has the two times tables down pat, do them anyway. Let the kids get 100s on their quizzes. They need to feel like, wow, school is back, I'm here, and I'm feeling really successful. Um, 
and you know choice i think is that my the last one that i want to talk about any opportunity where the kids can have choice i'll give an example um i talked about last time our screening protocol is where the kids are going to have their temperature taken they're going to have to swipe an id that their parents answered a questionnaire and then in order to show that they went through the screener and go up before they go to the classroom we're going to offer do you want a stamp or do you want a sticker something as little as that can really make a kid start their day off feeling positive, empowered, that they're in control of the situation. You've accomplished what you wanted to accomplish, but they also had the choice of the matter. And um, hopefully some of these tips, you can kind of fit into whatever your building's plans are and also you know, kind of meld it to whatever grade levels and age levels you work with. Thank you, Racheli. And now we're moving over to Tzvi. Okay, so she unmutes herself. Hi. Okay, so I'm going to show a PowerPoint, and um, I'm just going to start by saying I'm very excited to be here to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is resilience, promoting resilience in children, and also in a trauma-informed care framework. I'm also going to warn you that I am a chronic over-preparer, and so the two together are a very dangerous combination. So, Rabbi Leaftag, I'm going to ask you to please give me like a five-minute warning because I want to respect like everyone's time. And, but I do want to make sure that I have time to kind of show some of the practical tools that OHAL has created. So now I'm just going to um, share the screen. Okay, you're seeing the PowerPoint? Yes? Got it, got it. Okay, I've had, I have a traumatic history about my screen share not always working, so uh, okay. So I'm going to start by saying what I think everyone here already knows is the incredibly vital role of the teacher. I think so many teachers now in our COVID world are finding themselves responsible for way more than they sign up for, being teachers, disaster planners, case managers, and therapists a little bit. Um, but the truth is, is that teachers really do play such a critical role. Uh, kids spend so much of their waking hours in school. School is set up for routine and structure, and so it's a great venue for intervention. Uh, there's a lot less stigma when you're building resilience or teaching social emotional skills in a school setting, you know, in terms of the stigma around mental health. Dr. Bullmanthal spoke about how mortifying it is for some kids, let's say, who experience loss to be singled out. But when you're doing resilience building interventions for the whole class, you're not singling out those kids, and it's done really in a natural venue. There was a study done in 2007 in Israel related to a terror related uh, distress and uh, some trauma symptoms that some kids were having in, in class. And what they found was that teachers who received just four hours of training and did eight classroom interventions, as a result of really just that, uh, they saw that students' PTSD symptoms improved and no new symptoms developed. So we really um, can see that teachers can have a powerful impact. So what do trauma-sensitive schools look like? I'm going to use the term like trauma-informed care, trauma-sensitive schools, maybe a little inter interchangeably. What it literally means is making sure you're informed and educated about trauma in terms of being trauma-informed. So a trauma-sensitive school, the staff who work there will realize the widespread prevalence and impact of trauma. They'll recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma in their students, and Dr. Bullenthal spoke about that a bit. And, what, and very importantly, a trauma-sensitive school will seek to promote he healing and build resilience and do it in a very intentional way, an intentional and strategic way. So what can teachers do in a trauma-sensitive school? Well, firstly, they can become knowledgeable and informed about trauma, and hopefully your schools are helping you that with providing training. But even if they're not, you know, there's so much out there in ways that you can really learn on your own by reading about it or just seeking trainings, you know, like this one. And teachers will understand that kids returning to school now have experienced a collective trauma. And a few other things on the slide, I think Dr. Bowman's all touched on, but what I, the most important thing I think I wanna say about this is that a teacher in a trauma sensitive school is gonna view children with a trauma informed lens. They're gonna look at children and their behaviors and their needs through the lens of trauma, being informed about trauma. So what does that mean? So basically, let's say a child is having a behavior, they're acting out, they're having different issues or discipline issues. Instead of asking or thinking, what's wrong with you? A teacher with a trauma-informed lens is gonna ask instead, what happened to you? What happened to this child that they are acting in this way? And instead of maybe thinking or feeling, this child is giving me such a hard time, 
the teacher looking at this child through a trauma-informed lens and is instead going to say this child is having such a hard time. So that shift in framework really does make a big difference. It really does help you look at the child a little differently and hopefully intervene a, a little differently. So just this is a study that I really wanted to share uh, just to this point of being able to look at kids in a trauma-informed lens. It's a very interesting study. And basically, if you'll take a look at this picture here, you see five different emotions and with faces that represent these emotions of scared, sad, happy, surprised, and angry along a continuum from one to 10. So one, if you look on the bottom, being the least angry and 10 being the most angry and so on and so forth for all the different emotions. So a study was done where they showed this, these pictures to children who were exposed to trauma and children who weren't exposed to trauma. And what they found were that children who are exposed to trauma process feelings like a microphone sensitive to sounds. And in particular, anger was differentiated the most between traumatized children and typical children. And the traumatized children were much more likely to misinterpret anger, um, basically misinterpret a neutral emotion as anger. So that where the typical kids might have identified the angry feeling and actually most of these feelings closer around a five or so, the children who experienced trauma would identify the face like about number two or so as angry. Okay, and if you look at this picture down below of number two, this, this man really doesn't look very angry. Uh, and most neurotypical, ki the kids who had not experienced trauma did not pick up on that and did not feel that this face looked like an angry face. But the kids who had experienced trauma were much, very sensitive to anger and were much more likely to misinterpret that neutral emotion as anger. So what does that tell us, like using our trauma-informed lens? It tells us that those kids are a lot more likely to misinterpret a neutral request from a teacher even, asking about their homework, is like they're gonna personalize, oh, this teacher is now angry at me. And they're gonna be a lot more, more likely to misread the cues of the teachers. And this is actually, this challenge is really, I think, that much more so when teachers are wearing masks and kids are wearing masks. And in general, it's gonna be really hard to read one another's cues, but it's especially so children who've experienced trauma are really much more vulnerable to misreading cues. So what, what does that information do for the teacher? It just helps promote that framework of understanding, looking at kids with a trauma lens and helping us approach these kids maybe a little bit more gently or even understanding why they might have an overreaction. So in terms of building resilience, so trauma-sensitive schools are gonna to seek to very actively um, promote resilience. And what, this is really done in a very kind of strategic way. So they're gonna prioritize resilience. So just like history and math and social studies are you know, priorities in the curriculum, so building resilience is also gonna be a priority. And what we understand about resilience is that kids are not born with a set amount of resilience, that resilience is really like a muscle that you can grow and you can develop, and you can kind of bulk up a kid with resilience. Um, and But it has to be done in a very sort of strategic way um, and really be made a priority. So this was a, and we'll talk a little bit how we can do that. So this was a hashtag that I saw, which I really liked. Uh, so I want to share it tonight around a trauma sensitive school presentation. And the hashtag was hashtag notice the need, hashtag meet the need. Um, and I just added in between hashtag, you know, understand the need behind the behavior. And this is really in many ways the framework also with looking at kids with a trauma-informed lens. It's noticing that they have a need, understanding that there is a need behind the behavior, and looking at the kid with a trauma lens, and then doing your best to meet the need. And this idea is really the framework for many things um, that have to do with uh, teaching kids social-emotional skills and self-regulation, because it's rooted in the idea of really attachment theory that from infancy through really their youth, kids need adults who are gonna notice their needs and be responsive to their needs. And that when kids have adults around them who notice their needs and are respons responsive to their needs, this soothes the stress response for these kids and it builds trust. And this lays the foundation for kids to really be able to self-regulate and be independent. So how do we do that? How do we, in a strategic way, try to go about building resilience in kids and in our students? So this is a framework that we love at OHAL. We use this framework for pretty much all of our interventions, our mental health interventions in schools. Uh, Reverend Lee Tech mentioned our school-based services. We're in about 40 schools. And this is the framework that really helps us 
um, you know, sort of respond and intervene in the different schools that we're in. And if you take a look at this picture, uh, you see that there's three levels of interventions when you respond to trauma, when you want to build resilience in kids. So universal, selective, and indicated. And basically, this, this multi-tiered response basically says that all kids should have some interventions. All kids should have some resilience building interventions and strategies built into your school framework. That we're not just looking to sort of single out the quote unquote problem children. Obviously, we don't look at kids as problem children, but a lot of schools really reserve that this type of work um, for the kids who are, you know, having issues, having problems. But a resilience-based really framework, a trauma-sensitive school is going to provide interventions on, on these three different levels. So universal interventions is really education to build resilience, building social emotional skills, um, building and even many of the interventions Rachele spoke about, journal writing, arts, you know, doing different things for all the kids to be able to have a framework and process. Um, selective interventions are for the maybe 10%, 20% of kids who might be more at risk, kids who might be struggling, kids who for different reasons, um, maybe they experienced loss, maybe they had a prior mental health issue, maybe their parents lost their jobs, or maybe they have anxiety. So these are the kids that are gonna need extra support. And a lot of schools do have selective interventions. They might have school-based counselors, they might do groups for some of those kids, and that's very important. And then indicated is basically the 5% or so of kids who have behavior issues, who might have a psychiatric diagnosis. And it's important also to have a way to link up those kids for treatment. And these are the kids that generally need full-blown mental health treatment. So, and some schools actually have satellite clinics within their schools. Oh, ourselves has a number of school satellites in many different schools. But most often schools like just have relationships with various community-based clinics or providers, and they have sort of a fast track or a way to link up those kids for treatment. But it's important, again, a trauma-sensitive school and resilience-based school environment, you're going to intervene on all three of these levels. So I'm going to actually spend the remainder of my time just talking about um, universal interventions because that's actually what we want to show you is some ideas of different tools that OHO's created that you can really use that are user-friendly, can use them in the classroom, and they're really examples of uh, really universal interventions that all kids can get. So there's a lot, you know, resilience means like a lot of things to a lot of people, and there's a lot of different ways to talk about resilience and think about resilience. Uh, Dr. Blumenthal actually touched on some of those things. Um, there's research about, you know, gratitude, taking meaningful action, you know, helping others, helping kids have an actionable response, um, having a strong intergenerational self and building a family narrative was actually proven to promote resilience in kids. And there's a very fascinating study about that. We don't have time for that. But what, what I want to focus on in the remainder of my time is really about uh, building social emotional skills in kids, because that really is a foundation for helping build resilience with the idea that kids firstly have a social emotional vocabulary to identify the different things that they're experiencing, but all, more importantly, that the kids have the ability to self-regulate and to develop the skills to cope emotionally with life's adversity. So um, to that end, I actually, I'm sorry, one other point I actually want to make about social emotional learning and social emotional skills is that uh, it's actually studies have shown that uh, children who have social emotional skills that, that is a greater predictor of academic success than even IQ and that is why a lot of schools are building in, in you know SEL basically into their curriculum and OHA also has an early childhood mental health program and a huge part of that program is also introducing social emotional learning in, in kids. So this is something a tool that we created in our school-based team led by uh, Rabbi David Liebtag and it's basically a toolkit for entry into the classroom after COVID, well, during COVID rather. Um, and what this toolkit does is we, it, what I think adds value the most from this toolkit is that we actually inc include lesson plans. So it includes a three-part lesson plans for kids at uh, all different developmental stages to kind of give them a framework to process everything that's happened to them, to acknowledge the experience. You know, we're not just returning to school with masks on, right? We're returning to school, but we're not the same. We've been changed by what's happened. We, we, we shouldn't even be the same. And so this um, kind of gives a little bit of a framework to help us sort of process that and make some sense around it. 
So um, just to show you, uh, the Rabbi Leap Tech put the link for this toolkit in the chat, so you can definitely you can download it. You'd have to put, you have to put in your email address, and you'll be able to immediately download it. But just to kind of show you a little bit, so it's a three lesson framework. Um, like I, like I said, it's twelve lessons in all because it's the different developmental stages of preschool, elementary school, middle school, and high school. And the first lesson is what happened to us, so it explores the events that occurred, you know, during the month of quarantine. And the second lesson is, you know, how are we feeling? What do we need? And basically allows the teacher to kind of take the emotional temperature a little bit of what's happening with the kids. And if they um, are having strong reactions, it might give them sort of a way in, a lens in. And lesson three is really about looking forward and, and viewing hope for the future. Like Dr. Blumenthal said, like every crisis has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we also want to make sure that we understand that this is also going to end, you know, and giving kids sort of hope for the future. So these, this is basically the framework for the toolkit. And uh, together, it really provides a structure to help students integrate their experience. And it's not meant to be like a be-all, end-all. Obviously, teachers should look at it and adapt it and take from it what's useful and change what isn't. But it's something that is very user-friendly and a way that you can introduce some of these universal interventions into the, into the classroom. And of course, uh, what I want, also want to say about this is that students are, will really benefit the most from teachers who present these lessons while also modeling coping and you know maybe admitting to their own vulnerability you know it's not a weakness to do that it's actually a strength to be able to own and model your own feelings of like this was hard for me this was sad for me this is how i'm managing it and that's probably more powerful than anything time warning so, sorry. um i'm sorry what time warning time okay sorry so this is just a couple of the just to show you how it's like really user friendly because like, again, teachers have enough to do <laughs> besides uh, having to create lesson plans um, for kind of resilience and mental health type issues. So we just want to make it user friendly. So it's really very practical. This is the preschool one. This is the elementary school. And um, just to show you some of the um, actual activity sheets. Now this, I'm sorry, moving on to our next tool. Let's see, I have five minutes left. So this is a workbook. I'm very, we're very proud of. <laughs> we're in the middle of developing it at OHAL. It's not done yet, but stay tuned. It will be done in just a few weeks. We are partnering with some of the foremost trauma experts in the world. I hope I'm not overseeing myself by saying this. Um, in addition to, of course, our very own Dr. Blumenthal, we are also partnering with the Israel Center, the Maytev Israel Center for the Treatment of Psychotrauma. So that's Dr. Danny Brum, who's a very renowned trauma specialist as well as Naomi Baum, who's also a very renowned trauma specialist. This workbook was actually created in its original form by Naomi probably about 10 years ago, and OHAL has adapted it um, uh, many times. We've used it many times over the years in various traumas, and we've actually, we are now modifying it very greatly for COVID. So it's, this is geared for kids about K through fifth grade, and it's going to be, I think, a really good tool. So just to tell you very, very briefly a little bit about what this workbook does. When we talk about social emotional um, skills and uh, emotional self-regulation, um, this workbook, in addition to giving the kids the sort of vocabulary to, um, you know, sort of understand and identify their emotions, and the main emotions in the book are the foundation, let's be happy, sad, angry, scared, worried, um, one of the ways that we updated this book from 10 years ago is we actually, there are many ways we updated it, but is that we added calm because it's, the research shows it's very important for kids to understand what calm feels like in their body. That's very instrumental for their ability to self-regulate and calm, uh, um, uh, contrary to popular belief, the baseline is not happy, but calm. That you want kids to know what it feels like inside their body to be calm, how to make themselves calm. And so the, work, the original version of this workbook was almost more like, yes, you're identifying feelings and feelings almost like happen to you. But the newer version of this workbook really is very much based on the idea that children have the ability to move themselves in and out of a feeling. And they have that ability and how can they do that? And that's really what it's about. And every page, it's actually not on this, it's still in development. Every page of the emotion is actually gonna have like a thermometer of like, how much of the feelings do they feel from one to five? And it's all part of giving kids those tools to really recognize it and how to feel more of that feeling or less of that feeling, and um, which is part of um, self-regulation. And then, of course, you know, how masks 
you know, kind of come into play and sort of how they hide our faces and our feelings. And it was also very fascinating. And that's also going to be very prominently featured in this workbook. So this is going to be available. Um, sorry, this is going to be available probably in the next few weeks. Uh, it'll be for free uh, to download on our website. And for an actual print version, we don't at the moment have funding to be able to offer that. Could be that will change, and so, but it might be available for purchase the print the print version. But uh, we're happy to offer it as a service to the community, and that will be on our website in a few weeks. And then just the final tool I just wanted to show, it's already 9.58, uh, so I'm gonna really talk fast, is our middle school anxiety prevention program, which is a nine lesson plan um, curriculum for middle schoolers, which helps them deal with the transition from elementary school to middle school, and all the different changes from homeroom to departmental and experiencing puberty and peer relationships and all the different things that uh, we know middle schools experience and makes them more vulnerable to anxiety. So it's really uh, very much a resilience building um, um, curriculum that we have already implemented in many different schools. It's again, it's an example of universal interventions. All kids get this information. All kids learn these different skills and tools. And um, it's actually been a really wonderful uh, program that uh, we've had a really great response. And it's really just another example of just some of the tools that really are available that you can introduce into your schools to, to really in a mindful, like a strategic way, try to um, build resilience and give these kids these skills. So, um, just to end, I want to say that the norm really is resilience. Kids are incredible. Kids really tend to do well. They do recover. And um, that's really something that we you know, believe in. We're not looking to pathologize children. And I'm just going to end with uh, something that I wanted to show you. This was an actual narrative intervention that we did with a class in Coney Island after Hurricane Sandy many moons ago. It's one of the... Um, uh, tool, lessons actually or activities I would say in our toolkit which is a collective narrative so that the kind of classroom together creates a narrative around what happened to them so it's very powerful it's not just the individual narrative of each trial but it's like together as a class you know sort of building on one another's stories and sort of coming to some type of meaning making conclusion so this was a school that had been totally destroyed by Hurricane Sandy and they were relocated in a very very ill not a good setting um, it just was not appropriate for the kids, it didn't have the right, you know, there was like big cheers for little kids. And one of the preschoolers uh, who came into the school, the new school after they relocated, said, you know, oh, there are no colors on the wall. You know, the kids had really been through a lot. And so this was an example of um, an intervention we did with a fifth grade class who each spoke about their experiences. They actually um, had also experienced loss and um, the loss of life. And this was actually the sort of conclusion that the class, as they did this uh, narrative together, came up with. It was their words, and it was really very beautiful. It said, Hurricane Sandy destroyed our school. But then we realized that school is not a building. School is not walls. School is teachers who care and students who want to learn and it's parents who want to help. And it really kind of shows you how doing this intervention and this narrative kind of helped them sort of create some type of mastery and meaning making over what happened. And it also fostered, I think, the cohesive, cohesiveness of the group. So just really an example of, I guess, universal intervention and how it benefited those kids. And just in conclusion, we all know that teachers, you know, they give so much, they do so much. And that, you know, we hope that you will be, you know, merit being able to kind of bring color back into our kids' lives and into your own lives during this very difficult time that we're all living in. So thank you. Thank you very much, Sivi. Thank you very much, Dr. Blumenthal. Thank, thank you very much, Rachel e. Gross. And thank you again, Sivi Ryder. We have a few minutes left for questions. We have uh, a couple of questions on the website about accessing the material. Uh, first of all, the webinars will be on OHEL's website in about a week or so, including the previous uh, lecture, that previous webinar uh, that we did a couple of days ago. Uh, the uh, sixth grade curriculum can be access by contacting me and I put my email address in the chat and there also, there's also a link for the uh, toolkit uh, for re-entry into the class into the COVID classroom is on the uh, website is, is, is on the chat as well the link uh, will allow you to download it and you can print it out yourself we do not have any printed copies at this time 
we did have a question. Uh, I'm gonna. We have a few questions. If we have a few minutes to answer some of those questions, let me take one of them. Uh, here's a question from one of the from one of the uh, attendees. In light of the magnitude of the circumstances, how can I effectively address my students' needs while still keeping to academic standards? We started on Monday already. Several students are still disengaged and disinterested in their success. So, Dr. Blumenthal, Rachel, Itzvi. Rachel. I bet you yeah, that's a, that's a teacher question. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think it was too early to start with academics. I think, um, you know, September in general, and I think I talked about this back when, the, when everything first closed originally and parents didn't know what to do with themselves. I said, give yourself some grace. Teachers spend September setting up protocols and norms. So if that's a typical September, just think about what an atypical September would entail in terms of making sure that routines are in place and everyone, uh, you know, uh, my superintendent now keeps on saying that it's Maslow before Bloom. You know, you have to make sure that those basic needs are met before you even consider academics. Um, so maybe it's just a matter of slowing it down. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to add to that? I would just say that the uh, toolkit that we spoke about before has a lot of information that will help guide teachers along the lines of uh, what, what Racheli was just saying, including the lesson plans, which gives the kids an opportunity to really reflect on what's happened before you start diving into the academics. If kids are not ready emotionally to learn, they're not going to learn. So the idea is to slowly bring them into that, into that state. Um, another question that came in is, I'm nervous about building a relationship with my students since I cannot get too close to them. Uh, what should I do? I guess I'll jump in on that one, which is, you know, we are by natu naturally social beings and we crave contact. And when we have the limitations, uh, as we do now that prevent, let's say, very close physical contact, I have a lot of confidence that both uh, the, the staff and the students will be very creative and imaginative in ways to connect even maintaining social distance because the actual very natural instinctual need of people is to connect. And so I think, well, you know, well, you will, they'll, they'll find a way. I could just jump in on that. If you are um, working in a school where masks are going to be required all day, please take the time to take a video of yourself, introducing yourself without a mask to your, to your students. Yeah. Um, make sure that that gets shown the very first day. Even hang a picture of yourself up in the front of the room. They need to know who you are behind the fabric. Yeah, this question has to do with grief, Sylvia. This may be for you. Uh, if I know a student in my class who experienced a loss, should I say something to them, and what should I say? So, um, actually, Dr. Blumenthal, who is my <laughs> mentor, always trains me, and this is uh, something we found effective, is that... Um, when it comes to grief, again, you don't want to like call attention or have like a million people checking in with the kid, the child who experienced the loss, but sort of designate like one person in the school who can talk with the child about it and check in. And that is more effective than like everyone in that child's orbit in the school constantly talking to them about the loss. Okay. Another question, and this may be for the principal. The parents are burned out from having everyone home all these months. How much should I involve them? if their child is having problems with school? <laughs> um, I don't think that the rule of communication goes away just because we had a school closure. Getting ahead of any issues, I think the parents would be appreciative. Believe it or not, they may be frustrated that they were home, but they are so much more in tune right now to their children's behaviors around academics and school. And I think it's going to be refreshing this year that when a teacher calls home to maybe address a certain issue, they can actually the parent will be able to relate to the teacher on a whole new level, possibly forming stronger relationships. That's what I'm anticipating and that's what I'm being optimistic about. Okay, thank you. Preschool question. Uh, with regard to preschool kids, how do I differentiate between signs of trauma and normal behavioral challenges? Um, children, it's, a, it's an interesting question because children always have challenges because they're constantly growing and facing new expectations and growth. However, it's the, the challenges of growth are forward looking. The challenge, the, the expression of trauma is backwards. Uh, the trauma takes them back to a previous place that was scary. The, the difficulty mastering 
new skills or managing new social expectations are the struggle of the child to grow. And it has a very different flavor to it, I think. And, and I think certainly a preschool teacher who knows the children inside out and backwards and forwards will have a, a feel for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, our last question. I think all of you can deal with this one, but do you think kids will need to talk about COVID-19 or is it better not to have formal discussions? I want everything to feel normal. Oh, uh, and, I, and I want world peace, you know? <laughs> it's not normal. <laughs> you know, like that's, that's, that's everybody's favorite river, the Nile. You know, um, it's not normal. And I, and I think that, especially in today's world, we don't hide things from children anymore. That's in the age of information. And yes, it is, there is opportunity to speak, but here's the key point. And again, maybe uh, Mrs. Gross can speak about that better than I can, um, but it can't be obsessive. It can't be circular. In other words, the ideal, I think, and I think that's reflecting the toolkit as well, is either the teachable moment or designated times to address the trauma of, of, of the pandemic, both current and past, interspersed with the traditional learning because that's also healing life goes on we're still doing math we're still doing history we're still doing projects if i could add to that i mean even having you know even with the with the assigned time so for some kids that might not be enough having a, a decorated shoe box a jar in the classroom if the kids need a place to put it that's you know they can always stand up with the permission obviously of the teacher or however the protocols are get a special post-it note to put in that maybe, you know, feelings jar that the teacher can get to it when she has a moment and then address it individually with the child. Okay, we, we just have one final question that came in and, and because the person took a long time writing it, I wanna read it to you. At what point do we decide that a child's reaction is one that requires a higher level of intervention? A toddler experiencing social anxiety upon waking up and anticipating a day apart from one's caregiver and subsequently crying hysterically upon drop-off, clinging to the parent. What protocol is advisable so as not to disrupt other students? Um, so I, I think that's a very important question, and especially as we increasingly deputize teachers to address some of the more emotional, social emotional issues of children, which is becoming much more the norm. Um, it says we deputize many others. Uh, Dr. Pelkovitz and I teach the rabbinic students at Yeshiva University. And part of the lessons are, at which point do you say this is beyond my skill set and, and I need the assistance of, uh, of a mental health professional? And I think some of it is how universal it is. Is this the typical kind of adjustment type issues that come up in this grade at this time? I think how much it disrupts your life and how intractable it is. Um, and and in, in many respects, Having trained teachers, as I said, uh, rabbis, um, others to be sort of our, to be paraprofessionals, to be our deputies has made our work easier as mental health professionals because the work that can be relegated to us are really the work that we've done intensive training to do, whereas the more manageable types of interventions are being handled in a more natural way mm -hmm. by, let's say, the teacher in the classroom. Thank you very much, Dr. Blumenthal. Thank, thank you, Racheli. Thank you, Tzivi. Thank all of you for attending. Uh, appreciate all those insightful comments. We want to wish everybody uh, a, a wonderful year in, in the school and also a Ksiva Chasimatova. Thank you all for attending. Have a good night. Thank you.